All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new day and a new week as well. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. So maybe one of us can please lead in prayer. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, Asha, would you like to pray? Um, yes, Pastor. Dear God, thank you so much, God, for everything that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for another breath in our lungs, Lord. Thank you for everything that you are, Lord, in our lives. Lord, I pray right now, as we're about to learn the book of Corinthians, and when we're, as we're about to end also, Lord, that you feel us that whatever we learn, it's not just for our namesake, God, but we may understand the depths of what you have done in people's life in those times, and you're still moving on our lives, God. And thank you, Lord, that we may... Uh, hide your word in our heart and keep them and meditate them, Lord. Thank you so much, God, for giving us this opportunity to learn. And as Pastor Paul is teaching, Lord, that you pour out your spirit and help, and help us also to understand and fill us with your wisdom and knowledge. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Joshua. All right, so let me just post the notes. We've come to the last four chapters, and we are right now starting with chapter 10. So uh, we should be able to finish chapter 10, 11, 12, and 13. Uh, all four of them are relatively smaller chapters. So, uh, so let's begin with chapter 10. Chapter 9 was interesting uh, where uh, the Apostle Paul begins to, you know, he, he's bringing the whole aspect of giving. Uh, and he says, you know, uh, he talks about how the church in Corinth had been, you know, they said that they would like to give to the church in Jerusalem, which was going through troubled times. Uh, but it's been a year that they couldn't do anything. So Paul is exhorting them, saying, uh, you know, be a cheerful giver. Uh, now that I'm sending Titus and the team along, uh, do what you have to do. And uh, whatever gift that you have, give it to him. And Titus and team will go to Jerusalem and hand it over to the church. And, uh, and your testimony will be approved by all of them, even as Apostle Paul goes to Jerusalem, uh, he, he mentions that he will also inform the church that the church in Corinth is, you know, has given this gift. And Apostle Paul also, you know, we learned last week, uh, he taught us and he's teaching the church in Corinth how to give, right? He says that wonderful passage, right? You know, God loves a cheerful giver. So basically why he's saying that is because he didn't want the Corinthian church to be forced into giving. And these are lessons that we also learned, right, last week, uh, how to give. Giving is like sowing, uh, how much to give, how to give, and how not to give, right? Uh, so it's very important that we understand the whole aspect of giving. Uh, it's good to give out of, the, out of what we have, but we give, in a, in, in a sense that knowing that these are seeds that are being sown and God will bless us back. And uh, How not to give is to give grudgingly or give uh, you know, out of social pressure or just because I have to give, I'm giving. So it was a wonderful learning there in chapter 9. So chapter 10. Now, in the towards the end of this episode, Paul is again addressing the authenticity and authority of his apostolic ministry. Now here he goes into, you know, this, a few spiritual aspects, right? He warns about false apostles. He uh, he talks about uh, his spiritual experience, a little bit about the challenges that he faced. Uh, he doesn't give the whole list, but I think he talks about a little bit about that. So let's look at this, chapter 1 onwards. There may be a few verses that I would skip, uh, but let's see if we can just touch what is really important here. Right now, I am I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who's in presence, am lonely, lowly among you, but being absent, I'm bold toward you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Here's that wonderful passage. For the weapons of our warfare 
are not carnal but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when obedience is fulfilled. Right. So now Paul is, when he's starting this chapter, he's saying, listen, when, when I write my letters, I'm very bold, but when I come and meet you, I'm very meek. Right, uh, you see that balance he's got there, uh, and he's saying, "I'm pleading with you, the meekness and gentleness of Christ." But when he wrote the first letter to Corinthians, he was so bold and stern. Uh, and so it's not like Paul was, you know, somebody who had split personality. It's just that when he saw them, there was this love. Um, but when he thought about things that were happening in the church, maybe he. Realize, hey, I need to correct them, right? And and so here Paul is saying, listen, we didn't walk according to the flesh. Our ministry, the ministry that he uh, uh, that I'm doing, is not according to the flesh, but it's we are led by the Spirit of God, right? And the weapons of our warfare, right? the word flesh is nice, right? The Greek word is sarx, and the New Testament. Uh, the word flesh is used in a broader sense. We've got that list here. Uh, people in general uh, are referred to as flesh, right? The physical body referred to as flesh. The na what is natural or earthly or human is again referred to flesh. Food for the flesh, right? Again, life and nourishment. And this is one here: the sinful carnal appetites passion and desires. Now, this is what Paul is talking about, right? He's not talking about the physical body. He's not talking about the uh, earthly human body or food for the body. But he's talking about the sinful carnal appetites or the pa passions and desires. So Paul is saying, hey, we are not led by the flesh. We have but not walked by the flesh, which means not by our own passions, not by our own desires, not by our own carnal appetites, right? So what is the difference between walking in the flesh and walking according to the flesh? Right? Now, walking in the flesh is basically, you know, we're walking in the body, right? The Lord Jesus walked in flesh and blood. He was... He was moving among us, right? Uh, among the people. He was in flesh and blood. He was not a spirit at that time. So he was walking in the flesh. But walking according to the flesh is walking according to the to the carnal desires, right? The the walking according to the things of this world, right? And now Paul goes on to say, our authority or our warfare is not of that of of the flesh which means uh you know it's not according it's not of the flesh meaning it's not some you know people coming and you know trying to uh trap us and people coming and persecuting us beating us and putting us into prison yes that's all happening in the, in the flesh but uh the weapons of our warfare are not that but they are spiritual Right, they are spiritual warfare. So it's the it's something that's happening in the spirit realm. It's the unseen. Right now, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. Now look at these. I I want to encourage us to really each one of us to learn this. It's really really helps us in, in, in these in, you know especially in times of difficulties, challenges, when the enemy comes. Uh, these, this, has, this verse has really helped me, right? And I always put this in my mind. One, what are the spiritual warfare? What is it capable to do? One, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, bringing down everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to obey Christ. Right? Now, look at this the whole process here right now let's look at an example say somebody is addicted to pornography 
right? And no, he's not addicted. Say somebody, just a thought comes in. Hey, why don't you watch pornography? Right now, it's a thought. Then the thought goes into a second stage, which is reasoning and arguments. So what is that? Oh, it's OK. I mean, everyone are watching. I know a few friends who are Christians who watch. So I think if we watch once in a while, it's all right. So then yeah, you're going to step two. We're reasoning. We're arguing. Uh, we're contemplating on that thought. Now, third one is imagination. So imagination is closest to indulging in that sinful act, right? It's the, it's it's very powerful. You feel that you're already doing it, right? So you're imagining, watching it, and then the next one is strongholds. So you got the thought. It's just a thought that can come out of nowhere. Then you begin to reason. It's all right. The whole world is doing it. It's all right. You can ask God for forgiveness later. Then it goes into imagination. Okay, this is how it may feel. This is how it may look. Then we it gets into gets into becoming a stronghold. So that's why Paul is saying to cast down every argument, to bring down anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, to bring every thought captive. And that's where you and I, as believers, must really, you know, where every time a temptation comes, we take that thought captive. You cast down the argument. You pull down those strongholds. You say, no, this is not what God has expects of me because I have, you know, you use the word of God. And later on, we see here, right? Here, yeah, some of the spiritual weapons that God has given us to counter these. First one, the God's word. You and I can use God's word. So imagine this thought comes in, you say, Hey, no, I have the mind of Christ, the wisdom of God is formed within me. You use the weapon of God's word. Two, the name of Jesus. Say, In Jesus' name, I command that thought to get out of my mind. The blood of Jesus. I, and, and I, I, I pray the blood of Jesus around me, around my mind. I pray, I thank you, Lord, that your blood has cleansed me from all unrighteousness. What are we doing? Right? We overcome the enemy, Revelations 12, 11. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testament. I tell you, use those, these words, the blood of God, the blood of the Lord Jesus. Right? For the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right? So remember that we are sealed uh, through the Holy Spirit. And when we pray, we say, let the anointing of the Holy Spirit come upon me and to set the captives free, to liberate those who are oppressed. And we can just declare that, Holy Spirit, you are with me and help me to overcome this, you know, this uh, temptation or this thought that's come into my mind. And then praise and worship. Right? Uh, we know that when we praise and worship God, uh, God is able to break those doors, break walls. He's able to penetrate and touch lives. Right? So remember these weapons. Now, the, the battlefield is in the mind. The battle starts off with wrong thoughts and wrong desires. It all starts off here. Remember the Lord Jesus? What did the enemy do? Why don't you turn this stone into bread? Here. Now, Immediately, Jesus took the thought captive. What did he say? Man shall not live by bread. That's there's no there's no discussion. There's no second stage there. Right? Then the enemy says, uh, "Why don't you throw yourself?" Because the the scriptures say that he will set his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. What does Jesus say? Immediately, there was no. Thought, there was no argument. The thought was immediately taken captive. And this time, God, the Lord Jesus used all three temptations through the word of God. What a powerful example. Through the word, Deuteronomy 8. The second one, throw yourself. But then Jesus says, do not test the Lord your God. And then the third one. So you and I have these weapons. And now 
with the blood, with after the cross, we have greater weapons. Blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the anointing. Right? So God is calling us to use these weapons. Right? Authority for edification, verse 7 onwards. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider that this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such we are, such we will also be indeed when we are present. Now, look at this. Paul is addressing those who are talking about or judging him based on his outward appearance. And his, you know, history says that the Apostle Paul was a short man and bald, uh, uh, very tiny, and because of all the fasting and all the trials and beatings and tribulations and uh, you know perils that he has gone through you say that he was a very weak man compared to what he was when he was you know commander of temple guard before he uh, you know before the entire damascus uh, encounter he was commander of the temple guard bold and strong he goes up to the uh, high priest and he says give me letters and i'm going to wipe out this village and call christianity now the same paul is weak physically probably you know just not eaten enough not well nourished in his body now people are looking at him and saying is he an apostle you know he doesn't look like one he looks so weak he looks so uh He's so tiny, or he probably doesn't look even somebody who can, you know, start something. Or, or why should we listen to him? Right. So Paul is saying, based on the apostolic authority that God had given him, his responsibility was to build people up and not to tear them down. So he's saying. So you know, some of them probably may have said. Why should we listen to this man, Apostle Paul, whoever he is? You know, not everyone knows who, who's he. We don't know who's he. Let's do what we want to do. But Paul is saying, hey, my authority, the apostolic ministry, was given to me to build people up. So the reason I've written that letter, the reason you 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 see that letter is stern, is because I want to build you up, not to tear you down. Right? So he's defending his apostleship there. Look at that nature of God's given authority. When we understand that God gives a believer authority in line with his call. So it could, his call could be family, church, ministry, work, whatever it is. Now this authority is never given to bring destruction or it is never given to uh, bring down people. Now if you look at the first letter, Paul doesn't mention anywhere that I am done with you all. I'm not going to come back. I've done all the hard work and now you know I'm, I, I, I don't want to consider you as my children. He doesn't do that. He's rebuking them, exhorting them. He's doing everything. But he, he's doing it so that they can get back to where he wants them to be. And not even so, he also goes and visits them. Right? It's not like he's, you know, even in the second letter later on, he says, I eagerly desire to see you. Uh, the second letter, even the previous chapters, he mentions, right? I'm so glad that Titus has come back and said that you'll have taken the letter on the right way and you'll have made changes in your life. Now, who's doing that? It is God who's doing that in your life. So here's the nature of a God-given authority. God gives each one of us, maybe some of us in the pastoral calling or apostolic calling evangelists whatever god is called or worship leaders administration right just looking after the administration of a church 
all these God-given authorities are given so that we can nurture and build people up, see them thrive, see them flourish in what God wants them to be. Right now, Paul in person was not impressive. You know, looking at judging at by outward appearance, Paul himself was not an impressive person. Uh, but his speech was weighty. His letters was weighty and very powerful. Uh, look at this. Uh, I think the wonderful uh, comparison would be of that of David. Right? Remember David? So all his brothers are all nice and strong and big built in the army, ready to take on any any enemy that comes. And then Samuel says, no, no, no. There's somebody else. Go bring him. And then it was young, small boy named David. God says this wonderful thing. Samuel, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Look at this. The Corinthian church, maybe he said they've seen the Apostle Paul. He said, this guy is like writing the letters to us. Look at him, how he is. But the letters were weighty. They were powerful. They were, they were so powerful, filled with authority, the apostolic authority that, you know, there was something in the reader's hearts that, Corinthian church that would have gripped their hearts and that is why there was a change. So never, there's a very important lesson that we all must learn, we never judge people by their outward appearance. God can call anybody at any place, any time, use them powerfully. We need to learn to nurture, build each other up. Right? Uh, now, even if you read the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, it is a powerful letter. Just so powerful. It's power packed, right? You know, just full of revelation. Oh, but who writes it? This man who doesn't even, you know, doesn't even look impressive, doesn't even look like he's very learned. You know, there was a time, uh, history says that the Apostle Paul was so, you know, he, he's been in prison and beaten so many times that his speech was also you know, a bit affected because of being stoned. Uh, but his writing was powerful, touching the lives. Uh, picture it, think about it. Even now, thousands of years later, these letters are so powerful, so meaningful to each one of us as well. Now, he goes on, and verse 12 onwards, Paul is talking about his authority, and he says here, He's talking about a few limits of his authority. Verse 12, for we do not, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves by themselves are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. For we are not ex overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, not to boast in any man's sphere of accomplishments but he who glorify glories let him glory in the lord for not for not he who commends himself is approved but whom the lord commands now paul is saying that there are people who commend themselves by comparing themselves with themselves they're measuring what they can do between themselves itself now here's this is not wise because here's, here's two reasons why the Apostle Paul is saying this, right? So meaning people are comparing them, saying, hey, I'm better than this guy or I'm better than this other person because I can do this in a better way. Or I'm more holy than him or her because I'm able to spend more time. They're comparing themselves to themselves. Now here's two reasons why it's not a wise thing to do. When we compare with another person, 
we are using that person's qualities and abilities as a standard to measure which is a to measure which is not a true measure because it falls short of God's standard. And two, it is only God who can rightly judge another. And the Lord Jesus says, He says, judge not, you will not be judged. One. How can we compare ourselves to somebody else who they themselves have fallen short of God's standard? Now, when it comes to ministry, when it comes to leadership, sometimes as young people, young men and women of God, we want to compare ourselves to maybe some great ministers of God. Now, the right thing to do is not to compare but what we can do is look at them as inspiration. God, because when we compare, there are many leaders, many, many leaders in the past, in church history we studied also, right? many great leaders, but they have fallen in different areas. But in, in terms of ministry, they've been great, wonderful leaders. Probably some areas they were not able to raise up leaders. In some areas, finances, they were not good. In some areas, they were not uh, able to look after their family. They were not able to balance and look after their children. Oh, right? So we're falling short of the standard no matter what. But we can look at inspiration. I was just reading uh, a couple of days back about William Carey. How this man came into India during those times, right? With the lack of facilities, with the lack of, you know, the whole thing of education and the work that he has done in our nation is just so wonderful. How did he do it? I, I just kept thinking of this. But how did he do it? How was he able to buy these you know, huge acres of land, build schools, build a printing press, do all these things? And this is not, this is, you know, a time in a time when. You know, things are nowadays. It's easy. You can just okay call up. You people come. They get you. They can get things done. But you look at what they went through. Powerful, powerful work. But there were certain areas in his life that you know uh, he was not able to look after his family. He was not able to uh, you know uh, provide for his children. Uh, and there were certain limitations. But ministry wise, very great. So we don't judge, but we are to. You know, we have to use them as inspiration. Okay, he's he's done this for God's kingdom, and especially during a time when facilities and things were not so easy. God helped me to have that kind of a passion. Right. So Paul is plainly refusing to boast or to compare or to commend himself to anybody, anybody else, any other minister of God, and he says that even in. First Corinthians, remember he talks about that whole point of division within the church of Paul and Apollos. And you know, there was a close contention between Paul and Apollos because Apollos also is very learned. So that's why the book of Hebrews, people think people have two says. So some say it's Paul, some say it's Apollos, because they both were brilliant in their writing and in their uh, understanding of the gospel. So uh, so Paul is saying, I'm not going to compare myself to anybody. Uh, I will compare myself to God itself, right? And uh, I, I need to reach that standard. So Paul was aware of the realm of God-given authority, and he declares that they will not overextend their authority, not uh, by, and they will not boast in other people's labor or ministry as if it was their own. Now we must understand that there were plenty of churches that were birthed. Right now, for example, the church had started in Corinth. Maybe there were a few believers from here who went to another place and started a new church, but this was not his work. Right? So Paul is saying to the, uh, to the other ministries and other churches there, we will not boast in what they are doing. Because that's not our labor. God will honor them for their labor. But what is our labor is our labor. Right? So this is a very important learning. Yes, uh, somebody has a question. Okay. So this is very important uh, for today's church and ministry leaders to 
to stay in our influence and not to overstep. Uh, and a wonderful book is Divine Order in the Citywide Church. So, for example, as you know, evangelists, they get invited to come to a church and preach. Uh, they must know their their limitations. This is a church, so they must come in obedience uh, to the you know to the to the pastor of that church, right? And finally, he talks about Paul is talking about his authority, the realm of authority and influence. Uh, Paul carried included the Corinthian church because it was Paul who started the work and planted the church as a wise master builder. So Paul is saying, since I planted the church, you are my labor. I have the authority to speak into your life. I have the authority to influence you because I have built this church. Now, he goes on to say, our glorifying should only be in the law. So he's not saying, I have built the church so I can talk. No. He's saying, it is my labor. So God has given me the authority and the and I have to speak into your lives. I have to correct you lest I be judged for not being a good leader. So Paul is saying, this is my authority. Now, Paul is not writing uh, to the church in Jerusalem. Right? He's not writing to the church in Jerusalem, do this, do that. Why is he not doing that? Because he didn't plant the church there. The church was already there. Paul is not writing to the church in Antioch and saying, you are like this, you are like that. Please do this, do this, do this. No, he's not. Because it's out of his realm of authority. Remember, the church in Jerusalem was already there. The church of Antioch was already there. There were already apostles, prophets, everyone. So when Barnabas went and brought uh, Paul from uh, uh, Barnabas went after about a 13 year or 17 years in total, uh, brings Paul uh, to Antioch. The church was already there. They were just ministering there. They were not the leaders of the church. Then after that, they go to Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem, they were, he was not the leader of the church. So Paul is not using his authority to the church in Jerusalem and Antioch and all of that. He knows there are already leaders there. I can't step out of my authority. But the church in Corinth, uh, Philippi, Thessalonica, Thessalonica, all these churches, Romans, he speaks to them. Why? Because he planted those churches as a wise master builder. And he has the authority, God-given authority, to influence them. Right. So it's a wonderful, wonderful learning here. Uh, so remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty in God. God has given us those weapons. You and I as believers must use it. Right? I encourage each one of you to learn that scripture, put it into practice, right? uh, and, and you think about it. Okay, If a temptation comes, I, I take it captive and use those weapons to overcome temptations. Right? Uh, and we can because they are not carnal weapons; they are mighty in God. Right? Okay. So let's go into chapter eleven. Any questions? Uh, shall we move to chapter eleven? All right. So we'll move to chapter eleven. You have any questions? Feel free to raise your hand, or you can uh, just unmute and ask the question. Right? So he's bringing this entire letter. He's he's almost bringing it to a close. Uh, in chapter 11, Paul deals with the issue of the Corinthian church receiving and hosting ministers who are not sincere in their intentions, who seem to preach another message, and therefore unhelpful in the spiritual life of the believers. Now look at this. Right? The church, as of now, is trying to recover from a bruising that Paul has given them. The Apostle Paul is giving them. They are slowly recovering. Now Paul is slowly mentioning, hey, listen, what I've also heard is, it's, it's, it's most likely that Titus has come back with his team and has informed that they have, you know, they have some people who are coming and, you know, uh, talking uh, within the church. So here's what he says. Verse 1. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. 
Now look look at this. Paul is saying, please bear with me now. I'm going to go back and give you some more corrections. And I know you will bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin, virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now Paul is saying, look at this, right? He's saying, he's explaining and he's giving a defense of his ministry uh, and he's saying there will be if there are people within the church he's saying I, I, I possessive about the church because it's a uh, I'm possessive of it of godly jealousy now if there are pastors we look at pastors right they may possessive of the church in the sense that they're not holding them and saying okay don't go not that way but there's this godly possessiveness or this godly jealousy that they want them as a as a as a shepherd they want the sheep to be in good in good ground right and it's 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 a natural thing with god puts into the pastors but right? it's not now what happens when uh, when pastors go above that authority by saying you cannot go anywhere don't go listen to other people that is wrong right but there's this godly jealousy Oh, and there's a human jealousy. Human jealousy is destructive. But godly jealousy is motivated out of God kind of love. Right? So here Paul is saying, I betrothed you, meaning to join, to espouse, to be engaged to, to be married to. Betrothed you to one husband. Right? And Paul is saying here, both the Old and the New Testament presents the relationship of the people of God being betrothed to the bride and the groom. Right? So uh, we, we'll just, you can go ahead and read the book, uh, The House of God by Pastor. It's a wonderful book, uh, talks about the local church and the different the aspects of the local church, but we won't go too much into it. Uh, but here, Paul has a fear, has a concern that the Corinthian believers might get swayed away uh, by these new gospels or new messages that are coming across, new teachings, presenting another Jesus, a different spirit or a different gospel. Now, is it something new? It's not new at all. Now look at it. The devil has been doing this for the from the time he has come into this earth. He's been using the same methods. Deception. Self-deception. If he was self-deceived, then there's deception. 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 Lies. It, it, it's the same techniques. Right? Now he's now you see. Yeah, people are coming in and talking about another Jesus. Not the Jesus who came and did these wonderful miracles. Probably they're talking about uh, some speaker, intellectual speaker. And they're talking about a different spirit. Now they're not talking about the Holy Spirit, but they're talking about a spirit where we can, you know, probably uh, become rich or we can, uh, you know, uh, the spirit will help us to know the unseen realms or something. I remember, this is Corinth. This is in Greece, right? There were all kinds of learnings and new understandings that were coming up. Probably a spirit that can, uh, you know, uh, relate to the spirits of the sky. I don't know. Maybe those things, or a different gospel itself. Instead of Jesus, or instead of the gospel of salvation, they're talking about a gospel, a message of uh, hope. Right? Uh, just, just regular hope. Right. Now, Paul is concerned because they are like a sheep. They are like wolves in sheep's clothing. 
and he's mentioned that different places they enter in very subtly but they're wolves in sheep's clothing they speak of another jesus they speak of a different spirit they speak of a different gospel paul is concerned now he's saying probably he's thinking now you know i've just been correcting you all you'll have taken the correction but i've heard that you're allowing all these ministers to come in uh, so i'm very concerned now so what does he do about it he, he teaches them verse 5 onwards for i consider that i am not at all inferior to most of the eminent apostles even though i am untrained in speech yet i am not yet i am not at knowledge but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things did i commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because i preached the gospel of god to you free of charge i robbed other churches taking wages from them to minister to you and when i was present with you and in need i was a burden to no one for what i lacked the brethren who came from macedonia supplied and in everything i kept myself from being burdens to you and so i will keep myself as the truth of christ is in me no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of achaia why because i did not love you god knows but what i do i will also continue to do that i may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things which they boast for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of christ and no wonder for satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if he ministers also if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works this is oh, this is quite blunt and stern now look at what look at what paul is saying i firstly i don't consider myself inferior to all the eminent apostles you heard about peter you heard about james you know about james he's leading the church in jerusalem i don't consider myself less inferior why because i'm untrained in speech but in knowledge i have been god has given me the knowledge now we you must remember this the apostles peter james john they were not well educated peter was a fisherman probably just knew about the offerings and all of it probably didn't know much about uh you know the old testament itself but look at apostle paul trained under gamaliel he knew the old testament the the judean laws and principles of god so well that this passion and this zeal for god was so much for him he loved god he was passionate about god we see that that's why he went to you know to wipe out this religion of christianity but then he says you know three years in arabia paul writes and he says i went up to the third heavens the what i learned from the lord i give unto you the night the lord jesus was betrayed so the lord himself came and spoke to apostle paul right so he's saying i don't find myself inferior to these other, other apostles but i've thoroughly manifested among you all things right look at this uh, going down when i was in present when i was present with you i was not a burden for for you right nowhere nowhere has paul asked the church give me this give me that when i come there will you be able to provide for my needs no he's saying actually what happened was other churches churches like philippi and thessalonica and macedonian churches they gave me gifts and offerings and i used that money to come and visit you and to teach you and to minister to you so i didn't take anything from you but all i did was i gave to you as an apostle right and and now paul you know he he's he's making it public and he's saying that the ministry that we have done 
was not just some easy work. It was hard work. But what we're noticing is that people are coming in, creeping into the church, and boasting about the ministry as if they have done it themselves. And they're taking money from you. They're taking time. They're taking your uh, uh, all, you know, whatever you have, belongings. They're taking things from you. And not only that, they are teaching the wrong gospel. They're talking about another Jesus. Right? Look at verse 7 through 11. Paul did not ask the Corinthian church to take care of his expenses. He did not want them to be a burden. Right? Were there expenses? Of course. Right? You, you, we know that, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul was, you know, uh, a tent maker. Yeah. And if you have to take a ship, you can't just get into a ship. You have to pay them a certain amount, and then they will take you to the other place. And when you're in the ship, you should have enough money for food. And, uh, you know, it's going to be months of travel, so there's going to be food which you have to pay for. Uh, so all of these things are there. Right? So money was needed. Right? Uh, and so... The expenses of ministry was a legitimate need, but the contributions of the Macedonian church. Remember, the Macedonian church had given money to the church in Jerusalem. And Paul is saying, follow them. They have already given you, Corinthian church, it's one year you haven't given. Right? So Paul does not hold back in making it public uh, about the way in which his ministry expenses are met. He says to them, Hey, the churches have given me, but I have used that money to bless your church, bless Corinth. I have not taken from you. So I have so much of a right to speak into your lives. So the ministry that we are doing, you can't allow somebody else to come and say that, hey, uh, you know, it's their ministry, but they have done all the hard work. No. Right. You know, 12 through 15. Paul is suddenly bringing Satan into the picture here. For such, verse 13, for such are false prophets, apostles, deceit workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. For no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing that his ministers also transform themselves. So he's basically saying they are they are ministers, those who come in and preach another gospel, preach about another Jesus, preach about another uh, Holy Spirit, are, are, are demons or, or you know, evil spirits working, transforming themselves as if they were ministers of God and they've creeped into the church. The practice of deceiving and cheating someone, uh, mispresenting the truth, Paul is, he, he's very careful and he's saying, Listen, stay away from it. And he's worried now because they've already infiltrated the church. So now later on, he talks about how to get rid of them. Uh, so we'll take a break, we'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll continue from here.